job on Judges 2, 3, and 4. It explains what happens to 9-11. All right, Sarah, and unfortunately, i got to leave it there. Juan Zarate, thank you very much for being on the Washington Journal this morning. Thank you, Greta. Appreciate your time. Likewise. That does it for today's journal. We'll be back tomorrow, of course, at 7 a.m. Eastern Time with more of your comments and your phone calls. Now, live coverage of the House. I hereby appoint the Honorable Daniel Webster to act as Speaker Pro Tempore on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker, Speaker of the, the House, House of Representatives. Pursuant to the order of the House of January 17, 2012, the Chair will now recognize members from a list submitted by the majority and minority leaders for the morning hour debate. The chair will alternate recognition between the parties, with each party limited to one hour and each member other than the majority leader and the minority leaders and the majority whip limited to five minutes each. But in no event will the debate go beyond 11.50 a.m. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous consent to address the House for five minutes to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, on a cool September morning in Texas, I was driving my Jeep to the courthouse where I was a judge for a long time. I was listening to KILT radio, a country western station. Willie Nelson was singing Blue Eyes, Crying in the Rain. And all of a sudden, uh, Robert B. McIntyre, the newscaster for KILT radio, comes on. He interrupts the program. And he said that uh, an airplane had crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And that's about all we knew at that time. It was 8.46 Eastern Time, 7.46 in Texas. Continuing my daily journey to the courthouse, a few minutes later, he comes back on the radio and says that a second airplane had crashed into the second South Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. And the world understood at that time this was serious. This was an attack on our nation, on our country. After I got to the courthouse, we learned that a third airplane flying over Washington, D.C., very close to the building we're in, the United States Capitol, went down the street less than a mile and crashed into the Pentagon. And that was at 9.37 Eastern Time. And then a fourth airplane, we remember it as Flight 93, was flying toward Washington, D.C., probably the Capitol or the White House, where some good right-thinking folks took control of the plane from a hijacker, and they were crashed in Pennsylvania in some field at 10.07 Eastern Standard Time. Mr. Speaker, on September 11, 2001, this nation was attacked. 3,000 people were killed that day. It's interesting that the attackers decided to attack the World Trade Center because people from 90 nationalities were in the World Trade Center buildings, the South and the North. So it was more than an attack on America. It was an attack on the people of the world, freedom-loving people, people who believed in living life in liberty. The murder was done by 19 radicals who murdered in the name of religion. Of the 3,000 people that were killed, 411 of them were emergency workers. 341 were members of the New York Fire Department. Also, two Fire Department members of New York who were paramedics were killed that day. 23 officers from NYPD were killed that day. 37 Port Authority officers from New York and New Jersey. And eight emergency medical technicians and paramedics were killed that day. In the aftermath of that morning, first responders from all over the United States later that week went to New York to help in the recovery and help restore 
what had happened at Ground Zero. Many of those first responders still suffer from toxins that they acquired while working Ground Zero, as many members of first responders from New York and New Jersey are still suffering. But today we remember all of those people that were killed that day on September 11th. Later that evening, I, like most Americans, was watching television and saw the horror on video of what occurred. And I, like you, Mr. Speaker, saw those thousands of people in New York. When those planes crashed into the World Trade Center buildings, they were, they were fleeing as fast as they can and could from those terror that came from the sky. But there was another group of people, like the fire horses of old, that charged to the smell of smoke and the roar of fire. Those individuals charged to that terror from the sky. There weren't very many. There were a handful, but yet they were there. And of course, who were they? They were the first responders. They were the firefighters. They were emergency te medical technicians. They were the paramedics. They were the peace officers. And they, many of them, died that day. And while it's important we remember those that were killed, it's equally important we remember those that got to live, Mr. Speaker, because those first responders charged to that terror from the sky. And many of them gave up their lives so others could live on that famous day of September 11, 2011. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Yes, uh, that's for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on this solemn day in the history of our nation, the 11th anniversary of the terror attacks on 9-11, to honor and pay tribute to a North Carolina state trooper who was killed in the line of duty this past Saturday morning. It was a tragic, tragic incident. Trooper Bobby Jean DeMuth served the state of North Carolina proudly and honorably for 12 years. He was assigned to the Rocky Mount Troop C, uh, District 1 of the Highway Patrol. Uh, Trooper DeMuth loved his work. He loved his work as a law enforcement officer. He protected the good of our society from the bad, and he fought to make North Carolina a safer place. Trooper DeMuth's life was tragically cut short, and he was killed while in the line of duty. He was pursuing an individual suspected of some very serious crime. He was serving and protecting. Following a 20-mile, 30-minute high-speed pursuit that began in our capital city of Raleigh and ended by the heroic effort of Trooper Bobby Jean DeMuth, the suspect, suspect was apprehended. Tomorrow, Trooper DeMuth will be laid to rest at Inglewood Baptist Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. It is a sad, sad day indeed. Trooper DeMuth, like so many of the first responders who passed away 11 years ago, deserve our heartfelt thanks and appreciation for doing what only a select few can do, and that is to protect and defend the public against those who do it harm. May God bless Trooper Bobby Jean DeMuth, his family, and each and every person that puts themselves in harm's way to protect the greater good. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, uh, Ms. Black, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Twelve years ago today, our way of life, our freedom, and our fellow citizens came under attack in a series of ruthless and deliberate attacks. Today, we pause to remember and honor some 3,000 people, moms and dads, friends and neighbors, who lost their lives on that fateful day. We honor the first responders who chose to run into the burning World Trade Towers, putting their own lives at risk to save others. And we honor the lives of the heroes who fought the terrorists on board Flight 97 and successfully prevented the plane from hitting the White House or the U.S. Capitol. 
None of us will ever forget that day. None of us will ever forget where we were the moment that we heard that a plane had hit the first World Trade Tower. And none of us will forget seeing the second hit. America was shaken, but not broken. And in those dark hours ahead, Americans came together and responded with one voice. So today we remember and reflect upon a day that brought us all together as Americans, a day that was our generation's Pearl Harbor, a day that made all of us stop and ask ourselves what's important in our own lives. While many of our nation's leaders do not agree on how best to run our country, we are all in agreement with pausing to honor and remember those who gave their lives in this senseless attack. Where there is freedom, there is strength. Terrorism will never triumph. September the 11th, 2001, reminded all of us that, of that, and this is the day that we will never forget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. I thank the uh, speaker. I ask unanimous consent to address the House. Without objection. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. God bless America. I'm glad that we have songs that can capture our spirits and the love that we have for our nation. Reminded as a child singing the words to my country, tis of thee. And I'm reminded of that day, 9-11, the members of Congress gathered to stand on the steps of the United States Capitol to sing God Bless America. I rise today to pay tribute to Americans and a myriad of persons whose lives remain forever changed because of 9-11. We honor and mourn still those who fell on that day. It was the world, a potpourri of personalities, nationalities, languages, different descriptions and life stories. It was the world that was in America, a country that welcomes all. And then, of course, those of us who are reminded of the rushing in of heroes and sheroes, NYPD, civilian volunteers, firefighters, port police, federal workers, all in some way helping to save someone's life, fellow office workers, dishwashers, restaurant workers, some who died so that others might live. I remember very clearly where I was here in the United States Capitol, having a meeting with one of the cabinet members of the president at that time, deeply involved in work regarding small businesses, going on with the normal daily responsibilities, members who work on legislation and constituency issues and oversight over the government. There was a rattling outside and of course phones started ringing, at least the technology of that time and uh, we indicated that we were still in a meeting and did not answer until someone banged on the door and said, I don't know what is happening but you must get out. Without panic but certainly with great concern and as you entered the hallways people were rushing, rushing to come out of this building and as the rumors began to fly or the words began to fly about the White House, the State Department, and then, of course, the billowing smoke that one could see from the Pentagon. It was real. It was something that we had never, never, ever seen. Maybe those who'd been in wars preceding us in faraway lands, but not in the 20th century on the soil of the United States of America or the 21st century. And so I stand today with great honor of those who died and those who died in trying to save others and those who did. And I am grateful today that we have the opportunity to be able to say thank you, though sadly, 
to families who remain, to those who now stand in New York reading names, to those who are at the Pentagon who still have the piercing feeling of loss, and certainly those in Pennsylvania, those family members, those surrounding community. I'm grateful that in the last couple of days we finally acknowledge that there is something to those who breathe the smoke and they are now going to be included for the uh, entity that provides health care for those who are impacted by 9-11 toxic smoke. It took us too long. I'm glad we passed legislation to help the first responders, firefighters, police and others who suffered catastrophic illnesses remaining after they went in to help those who could not help themselves. I remember drafting legislation and introducing legislation for the latchkey children. For many of us don't remember that so many children were left at home and no one came home to see them on that fateful day, 9-11. Children now read the names of their parents or loved ones, grandparents. Children grew up without a family member because of the heinous and horror of hatred, contempt, and violence. And so I hope this nation on this day comes closer together, that we come together as independents, Republicans, Democrats, and nothing, that we stand as one nation being able to be reminded of the greatest nation in the world. God bless America. For I will say that throughout my life, for whatever the ups and downs that we may have, this country is great. As I travel around on behalf of the United States of America, visiting those who fought in Iraq and have fought in Afghanistan, I see that they are great because they were willing to sacrifice at the call of the Commander-in-Chief and the call of their nation. Today I come on this floor to honor all of those who were touched by 9-11 and to remind all of us as members of Congress and the nation, never yield to weakness that we are not great. Always our democracy, our love of God, makes us that. God bless America. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We returned to Capitol Hill, ending the summer recess with strong conflicting emotions. Today is the 11th anniversary of 9-11, the horrific attacks that rocked the nation and especially were poignant for us on Capitol Hill. As representatives of the government, we had sworn to uphold and defend these senseless, horrific acts exposed a real vulnerability. We all remember what we were watch as we felt as we were watching the Twin Towers collapse and then the plane crash into the Pentagon, and then yet another plane going down in a lonely field in Pennsylvania, destined for us here on Capitol Hill. But people came together in an outpouring of support for one another and for our nation. There was a sense of resolve unparalleled at any time since the cowardly attacks on Pearl Harbor. The response of the government since then, however, has been somewhat mixed. We have protected the United States so far against any repeat attack, but at great cost. We've thrown money at the problem. We've had significant bureaucratic overreach, particularly in terms of personal liberties. And we will be paying the costs of the horribly misguided war in Iraq for generations to come. After an original terrific response routing the Taliban in Afghanistan, we took our eye off the ball. We allowed Osama bin Laden almost another decade of life and mischief. Later, we were sucked back into Afghanistan on the terms of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, not on our terms. Now, this is not merely a Republican problem, although George Bush and the Republicans were in charge and made some of the worst mistakes. There was much bipartisan support for the excesses. To this day, there is bipartisan confusion about the best path forward to protect the nation while protecting civil liberties for the situation today and not the conditions of September 10, 2001. My wish for Congress, as the candidates fan out on the campaign trails, is that we mark this anniversary with a commitment to allow a little common sense and goodwill to enter into the political discourse. This can be an emotional job. And I was thinking about the emotions that I expressed uh, having a chance 15 years ago 
to go through the hectoring and interfering military on Aung San Suu Kyi's compound in Burma, where she was held under house arrest by the dictatorship. My son, daughter, and I spent an amazing afternoon with this extraordinary woman. I could scarcely imagine then what will happen next week when we will be awarding that courageous woman the Congressional Medal of Honor here in the Capitol. And then she will return to Burma as a member of their nascent parliament. The success of this woman together with the steely resolve of the American public after 9-11, ought to give us all pause and hopefully a renewed commitment to do our job right. Since 9-11, the challenges and circumstances have evolved. We have greater challenges in terms of uh, security, climate instability, natural disaster, and our own economic vulnerability. It's a tall order to deal with them. But hopefully we will all be inspired by the example of Aung San Suu Kyi standing up to the Burmese dictatorship and ultimately gaining a measure of success and, of course, by the American public in their response to horrific attacks. It's time today for the politicians to do their job. Politicians to listen, to speak the truth, and to lead. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Wilsey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a few uh, minutes from now, members of the House and the Senate will head to the Capitol steps. We're going to the Capitol steps for a moment of remembrance to honor those who were killed in the attacks on September 11, 2001. September 11, 2001, a day that will forever be seared into the American citizens and the world's mem memory. Eleven years later, Mr. Speaker, spouses still grieve. Children still feel the void. Parents are still devastated by the loss of their children. It was a tragedy. It was a tragedy for individual families and for the entire nation. One of the lingering tragedies of that day is that it led to policy decisions with terrible consequences that we're still living with today. Over the last decade plus, violence and mayhem has just led to more violence and mayhem. Our continued military occupation of Afghanistan has not brought the stability. It has not brought security. It has not brought a strong democracy to that country. Afghanistan remains one of the poorest and most dangerous places on earth. The Taliban has not been driven into oblivion. The terrorist threat continues. And according to a New York Times article this past weekend, even U.S. commanders are admitting that the Taliban remains resilient while Al-Qaeda is evolving and adapting. Mr. Speaker, while we in the House adjourned for the month of August, there was no recess for our troops. In fact, since we were last in session, another 60 U.S. service members died in Afghanistan. Countless more suffered wounds to the body and to the brain. And then there are the Afghan civilians, many of them children, who are being killed every single day. How do we tell the families of these children that this is all for a good and just cause? We can't. Mr. Speaker, it's time to stop conducting national security policy on the principles of revenge and retaliation and on the false hope that we are making it better. The right way to secure and ensure security is to put America's best foot forward, to lead with our compassion and not our military power. That's what my smart security platform is all about. It puts development and diplomacy front and center, and it makes war a last resort. It is based on a commitment in, 
to improving the lives of Afghan people, alleviating power, creating economic opportunity, rebuilding infrastructure, improving education, attacking public health problems in that area. We can't do this with a military surge. We can only do it with a civilian surge, a surge of experts, of aid workers, of technical experts from engineers to midwives. Of course, our development agencies are doing this kind of work, and they're doing the best they can possibly do. But there's not nearly the scale that's necessary to make this possible. Compared to billions of dollars every month that we spend on the war, we're investing just a tiny fraction of that on humanitarian work that is so badly needed. Public opinion has turned dramatically against this war, and yet our most visible leaders continue to lag behind the people that elected them. The President of the United States says he'll end this war in 2014, which is a good goal, but it is not nearly soon enough. His opponent, on the other hand, in the most important speech of his life a few weeks ago, didn't see fit to even mention Afghanistan, not even once. So, Mr. Speaker, when we gather on the steps of the Capitol, as I bow my head, it will be in remembrance of those who died 11 years ago today. And it will also be with a fervent prayer of hope that we can honor their memory by finally ending the war in Afghanistan and finally bringing our troops home. I yield back. Chair, sure, recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder, for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, 11 years ago today, American found, Americans found themselves under attack. We watched with shock and horror as hijacked passenger airplanes were flown both into the World Trade Center towers and the Pentagon. We all remember what we were doing that Tuesday morning when 2,996 innocent Americans were killed in those tragic and unthinkable acts. We also remember the heroic actions of the passengers above United Flight 93 who courageously fought the hijackers on their plane and sacrificing their own lives ultimately saved countless others. Courage and bravery have long been traits demonstrated by our fellow Americans, from declaring our country's independence to fighting alongside our allies abroad in the name of freedom and liberty. Americans, though, are also resilient. We band together, we pick each other up when we're knocked down, and we endure. In Kansas, we are extremely proud of the men and women in our military that serve our country and defend our freedom and liberty around the globe. Their willingness to pay the ultimate sacrifice for their country, their true heroism, is known firsthand only to a small number but is yet sadly far, far too common. The 3rd District of Kansas lost two such heroes this summer as a result from combat operations in Afghanistan. Army Sergeant Mike Knapp was deployed out of Joint Base Lewis McCord out of Washington State. He was killed in mid-May while bravely serving his country only three days before he was scheduled to return home to Overland Park, Kansas. Also, Private First Class Cale Miller, deployed out of Joint Base Lewis McCord, lost his life in early June when an improvised explosive device detonated near his vehicle. Private First Class Miller was a 2007 graduate of Olathe Northwest, where he was a member of both the football and track teams. It breaks my heart each and every time I learn the news of a soldier who has lost his life so our country can continue to live in freedom. As we remember this day, the 11th anniversary of September 11th, Mr. Speaker, we remember it by honoring all those innocent lives lost on that tragic day. We also remember the first responders, the firefighters, and the policemen who charged the burning buildings to save lives, ultimately giving up their own in the process. Let us also recall the steely resolve of American patriotism and unity as our country courageously responded against the terrorists responsible for this tragedy. On this day, let us also honor and support our, all veterans who have served our country. We pay tribute to those fellow Americans who serve in our military, protecting us and ensuring acts such as those of 11 years ago never happen again. Our message of thanks is one that cannot be spoken strongly enough. To those who serve, 
those who lose their lives defending our country, and the families and friends who support them, we are eternally grateful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. Pursuant to Clause 12, for an A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until the hour of 12 noon.